Yeah, so yesterday I was admitted as an, as an Australian lawyer in the Victorian Supreme Court. Um, it was a really great accomplishment. Uh, out of the 55 people, I was the only Somali, the only African or black person, and the only Muslim woman. Um, and I was the only one wearing hijab, so it was really fantastic. Applications for the admission of lawyers. Ms. Lucky Geary. If the court pleases, I appear to move that Lucky Geary uh, be admitted to the legal profession as an Australian lawyer and as an officer of this honourable court, and I so move on the certificate and recommendation of the admissions board. It's Ms. Geary in court. We had uh, three judges at the front who were explaining what was happening. We had 55 people getting admitted um, at the ceremony. We had all the people getting admitted sitting in the middle. First, the judge would say, would hold out your compliance certificate, which is um, basically a certificate saying that you um, have been admitted as an Australian lawyer and officer of the Supreme Court of Victoria. And they read out your name, and then they ask the mover to, um, if they're supporting your admission, so the mover stands up, and they say, yes, I support that Lucky Gera um, gets admitted as a lawyer um, and officer of the Supreme Court of Victoria. We get to sign our names on the bar roll. So there's this massive book basically with all the lawyers who get admitted and you get to sign your name. Um, and then we also got this really beautiful uh, book from the Supreme Court, it's a history of the Supreme Court. And then after that, yeah, I'm, I'm admitted as an Australian lawyer, which is really fantastic. The court being satisfied that each applicant has met the requirements for admission will order that each applicant be, admit, be appointed an Australian lawyer and an officer of the Supreme Court of Victoria. Okay, to be admitted to practice law um, as a lawyer in Australia, it's quite an involved process. You have to do a lot of study. So I had to do a bachelor degree, so I did a bachelor of law um, from the University of Adelaide. And then I had to do a graduate diploma of legal practice at the College of Law, which is all the practical subjects and um, work experience. And then after that, I had to do a huge application. <laughs> and um, I had to prove that I had all the academic qualifications, the work experience, and that I was a fit and proper person to be admitted to practice law. I also had to get like two people to write statutory declarations, claiming that I was also a good person. And then after that, um, you have to get an uh, invitation to get a, to book yourself into a ceremony. And alhamdulillah, I, ha I got the second last ticket for that ceremony. So if I had been five minutes late, <laughs> I wouldn't be getting admitted. I wouldn't have been admitted yesterday. I would have had to wait until October. See you at like the start, start of the law profession. So um, when you get your compliance certificate, it means that you are an Australian lawyer, but you can't provide legal advice until you apply to get your practicing certificate, which is just a quick process. You apply, you get your practicing certificate, and then from then, you have to be um, working under someone else who can supervise you for the first two years or that you have your practicing certificate. And then after that, you can set up your own business, you can set up your own law firm. Um, for me, I am going to wait to get my practicing certificate because I'm going to London to study for a Master of Law. Um, I've been accepted to do a Master of Law in Human Rights, Conflict and Justice at SOAS the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and Alhamdulillah, praise be to God, I've gotten a full scholarship with uh, the Commonwealth Foreign Office um, um, and the scholarship's called the Chevening Scholarship. Okay, so how did, how did I get a full page scholarship to study at London in one of the most prestigious universities in the world? I actually applied as a Somali person to, um, for, this, for the Chevening Scholarship. No, because I'm a dual citizen. I have both Somali and Australian citizenship and I've got both passports, um, which I recommend every Somali person in the diaspora and within the Somali country to get their passports. There's a lot of opportunities and it's, it's just nice to have 
you know, the passport of the, your country of birth. It was a really involved process. Uh, the application had to be in by October last year. Um, and it was a really big process. Uh, I found out that I got shortlisted for the interview in February. And then the interesting thing is that I had to actually go to Somalia for the interview because they don't do Skype or phone interviews. So the Commonwealth Foreign Office, which is similar to DFAT in Australia, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, they look for people who are leaders and who are possibly, you know, upcoming future leaders uh, around the world. There were thousands of people who applied, I think more than 4,000 people applied, and only about 1,800 people in the world got this scholarship. Uh, the scholarship is a really prestigious scholarship that looks not only at your academic, you know, work, that you're a good student, but also looks at all the extra work that you've been doing in the community, and they also look at your leadership skills. So the reason I believe I got the scholarship is because I was a solid student, but most importantly, I did a lot of community work, and I did, um, I went to, I represented Somalia and Australia um, at various international um, conferences, even I think in, 2000, in 2013 I represented both Somalia and I was both the Somali and Australian delegate to the United Nations Alliance of Civilization Summer School in New York um, and it was really great for me because I was able to promote multiculturalism, um, looking at building bridges between Western and Islamic civilizations and also looking to promote youth leadership and just global leadership for women um, and the reason that I, I got the scholarship is because I also plan to relocate to Somalia after my master's program and work in the post-conflict reconstruction process um, helping build Somalia's justice systems. You've got two locations, so you could either do your interview in Mogadishu or in Hargeisa. And since I hadn't been back to Somalia since um, I left due to the war, um, I hadn't been back for 25 years, uh, I picked Hargeisa. So two weeks after my interview for the scholarship, I found out that I got into the university program, which is a Master of Law, um, Human Rights, Conflict and Justice at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. So I was really happy about that, but finding out about the outcome of the scholarship took a long time. So what I'm planning to do after I finish my um, master's degree is that I want to go, I'm planning to go back to Somalia and work um, as a policy advisor to the government um, and help Somalia with rebuilding its uh, legal systems. How's your Somalia? I'll be completely honest, my Somali is really good, like conversationally, I can talk, I can, you know, have chats with people, I can, I'm pretty fluent, but the issue is um, when it's anything to do with, like with politics or, you know, talking about using technical terms, I am out of my depth. So the reason I picked uh, the University of London um, and specifically the School of Oriental and African Studies is that they teach Somali. Um, language and culture at the university so I am planning to improve my professional Somali skills, language skills, while I'm um, completing my Master of Law degree. What I know of the legal system in Somalia is that there are lots of layers. So we've got Sharia law, we've got um, Her, which is like a Somali traditional law, we've got different levels um, of the legal system in Somalia as well, you know, um, at the state level, um, all the way to the federal level and different regions have different legal systems. So try, I think one of the biggest challenges for Somalia is having a, um, just a, a standardizing the legal system um, to make it easier for people so that, you know, regardless of what region they're in, they're, they're able to navigate the legal system over there. What I've found most interesting about HAIR, what I've read about it, is that out of all the other legal systems, um, that have survived since the war, that it's the one that survived the most and it's the one that was most applied during the Civil War. The thing I found most interesting is, you know, in Australia you have a, a common law system which means that, you know, the law is made by judges um, and, you know, lawyers arguing in front of judges to try and further, um, you know, a legal principle. And in Australia what happens is, 
you know, if you do something wrong, like a criminal act, you, and you're found guilty of it, you're sentenced and you're put into jail. So it's punitive. But I found that in Somalia, you can buy your way out of a lot of things. So what happens is they find that, you know, someone did something wrong or they did a criminal act. They have the option, the, the victim's family or the victim has the option of accepting monetary compensation, like getting money instead of asking that that person goes to jail. So I found, I found that really interesting. Um, and it was just a different perspective of, um, of, of resolving dispute. The thing I liked about Somalia is that there's, it's, it's really exciting to be there. There's a lot of development happening. There are a lot of people who are building, rebuilding the country. There's a lot of people from the diaspora who have come back and there's a lot of people who haven't left the country who are building the country up. I think that there's a lot of potential there. But at the same time, we have a lot of development that we need. Legally, I think that there needs to be um, a system set up to properly categorise you know, land tenure issues, meaning finding out who owns what and what happens to land that people left you know, in the war and when returnees from the diaspora come back trying to get their land or their property back but they find someone else living there. Trying to find ways to resolve conflict in that situation so that it doesn't you know, ignite further conflict. Because what we want is we want to build our country and make sure that it's as stable as possible. And I think I would ask all people in the diaspora to come back um, to contribute their skill set and their expertise. Hairdressers, chefs, farmers, lawyers, town planners, people working in sanitation, any type of skill that you have is needed in the country. You'll be surprised by what you can do and how you can help in rebuilding your country. Please come back. <laughs> so I would just say, first of all, generally, if there's something that you're interested in, right, and um, go after it. If, whether it's in education, whether it's a trade, like if you want to be a carpenter or if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a dancer, a hairdresser, whatever it is, do something that you're passionate about. What I've learned is that once, you know, the money can only motivate you for so long, but you need to find something that you're passionate about. For me, I got into uni thinking I was going to become a doctor. But to be completely honest, I was doing that because I thought that's what my parents wanted me to do. So when I applied for law, I didn't tell my family. <laughs> I applied, I accepted the, the, um, the offer, and then after I had already accepted, I told my family my decision. Um, and I got the exact same thing that you know, certain some other people would get, which is you know, the parents saying that it's haram, or that it's not, you know, it's not the right thing to do, or there's a, you know, it's not a good profession. But what I said was I explained that the law is a huge, huge profession. There are so many different areas of law. There's so many different things you can do, just with any profession. And it's not, no, it's not as clear as you know, halal haram. In our religion, there's only certain things that have been outlawed for us that are haram. Everything else is, is acceptable for us to do. And when it comes to our profession, as long as it's not been you know, explicitly said that it's haram, I think that we can go into it. Um, I think that with parents, some other parents, what I've noticed is that they are quite conservative because of their experience in the war. They're trying for us, they're trying to guide us in a system that either they don't understand or that they are trying to grapple with themselves. They, if they haven't seen someone else succeed in that profession, they are unlikely to support you in doing it. So what you need to do is you need to just reassure your parents that this is something that you're passionate about and that you will be able to make a good living out of it. Um, specifically with law, from my experience, is that even if you end up not working as a lawyer, you can work um, in many other professions, in journalism, in business, in policy work, you know, in many other professions because having a law degree is seen um, very highly. Um, the reason I chose to get into the legal field um, is, is a bit it's not a straightforward uh, journey. So when I finished high school, I, I thought I wanted to become a, a doctor and I got into a Bachelor of Health Science at the University of Adelaide. Um, but very quickly, I found that the subjects I was most passionate about were the policy subjects, the public health subjects, the subjects about ethics and social justice. Um, and although I was getting good results in the subjects I needed to become a doctor, such as anatomy, um, physiology and, and, and pathology, they just didn't really motivate me. And on top of that, I think inherently I wasn't meant to be a doctor. I, I hate blood, I don't like being around sick people, I don't like hospitals, so I, I don't know how I would have overcome that like inherent, you know, 
aversion to th things that would be um, required of me to do um, as, a, as a doctor. And so in second year, instead of you know, continuing towards um, a profession that I knew deep down in my gut I, I hated, I did not want to do, I, I really listened to what I wanted and I applied to also do law because I was really passionate about social justice um, and ethics. Um, and so that's why I ended up getting a double degree in health sciences, in public health and in law. What motivates me every morning to get out of bed is that I want to live a life that excites me. I want to live a life that is true to, to myself, uh, true to my culture, true, true to my religion and true to my, what I'm passionate about. Um, you know, at the end of my life, I don't want to look back and regret anything. So, and I know that time is limited, so every day I see as a really valuable opportunity to get the most out of life. You can, you know, you, you'll never be able to, to get time back. You only get one shot at life, and it's your life. So regardless of what anyone else is saying to you, you know, telling you how to live your life, or telling you what profession to go into, telling you, you know, the barriers that are in front of you, just ignore them, because in the end, you know what you're capable of, and it's your life. The court congratulates each and every one of the new Australian lawyers admitted today. Take pride in your achievement because you have worked so hard and so diligently to reach this point in your lives. But do not forget those who, for so many years, have had to put up with your histrionics, panic attacks and assorted neuroses, for you owe them a debt greater than you could ever imagine, as in time you will come to appreciate. Say that a lot of my success, if not the majority of my success, is due to the way I was raised and due to the support that both of my parents, my dad Alad Hamal and my mum gave to me and my siblings. So with my, our parents they always pushed us um, to gain an education and they always told us that regardless of if you're a boy or a girl, that you are they expect the same things of you. They expect you to be a good Muslim, they expect you to contribute to your community and they expect you to be an outstanding student. I actually went to Adelaide, I got my mum and I brought her to Victoria, so that to Melbourne, so that she could be there at my um, admission ceremony. She was ecstatic, she was so happy that I I've gotten admitted as an Australian lawyer in the Supreme Court of Victoria. She knows how much hard work I have um, I've, I've done to get to this point. I mean, I was at university for seven years and then it took me about two and a half years to finish my graduate diploma of legal practice because I was also working. Um, and she knows all the struggles I've been through and she was always supporting me not to give up. There were times when I wanted to drop out of law school, I wanted to just you know, stop doing my diploma, I just wanted to give up, but she kept pushing me because she knew that without struggle there's no success. I'd like to shout out to my mum. I don't want to thank her because she's really built me um, up to be a strong woman and um, you know, to always go for my dreams. I'd like to give a shout out to my sister Ramla, who is moving to China. She's doing a Master of China Studies at the University of Shenzhen in Hangzhou province. And she's also got a full scholarship through Chinese government scholarships. Um, I'd like to shout out to my cousin Huda Gamar, who just recently finished her PhD at the University of Shenzhen. And now she's a lecturer at Shenzhen Normal University. Um, and I'd like to shout out to everyone who has supported me um, who has propelled me to all my teachers and my friends and my family who have believed in me. Um, and I'd also like to give a big thank you to the Chevening uh, Secretariat and the Chevening Scholarship for allowing me, um, for giving me the opportunity to pursue my studies at, at SOAS, uh, University of London. So I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed to my success. I'd also like to shout out to Adelaide, where, which, which is like uh, the place that helped form me as a person. To remember to surround yourself with like-minded people. Um, they say that the five people who are closest to you, your five closest friends, determine your success. So make sure that you are surrounding yourself with successful people and people who are going to push you to be successful.